hope you all survived yesterday's early burst of summer. Uh, mm. Rather different putting on coolers rather than heaters. Thankfully it's far more pleasant this morning. And thank you again for the choir for their intro. It is an induction, introduction to our worship. I trust everybody who's been fighting bugs and afflictions is coming back uh, a little better than they were. Unfortunately Will and I are still struggling after all this time, just wish Will a, a speedy recovery. We acknowledge we're holding this service on the land of the original owners, the Wartheron people, and pay our respects to Elders past and present. Welcome to today's service and uh, our fellowship together. To everybody here in the chapel, it's good to have you with us, and to all those who are watching online, a warm welcome joining in our worship today. And wherever you may be, we, it's great to have you with us. I hope your reception is loud and clear and you will receive a blessing from today's message. Now, today's reading from the Gospel of Mark is a rather well-known one, but a somewhat apocalyptic prediction from Jesus about the potential destruction of the beautiful Jewish temple in just three days after it had been built, extended and renovated over some 500 years, the centre of Jewish religion and the largest religious sanctuary in the known world at that time. So quite <coughs> a prediction. And it happened 40 years later, by the way, when the Romans destroyed the temple. It took a little bit more than three days, but still. There's also a prediction of catastrophic events that will occur. Now, Will's theme is watch out. Not so much the watch out if a bicycle is careering towards you on the footpath, or to duck if you happen to be at last night's cricket match and a six was flying into the crowd. But more be on the watch for these events coming to pass. And <coughs> we'll see later in the reading, there's war, conflict, false prophets, earthquakes and famine. Things Jesus said must happen, but 
are not the end of the world. So watch out is more likely to be be alert but not alarmed. They have to happen like the first pains of childbirth to usher in a new age or a new life. So there's a lot of symbolic language happening there about the future which I'll leave Will to elucidate upon. And just finally, uh, there are Uniting Church uh, Christmas card forms available in the, in the foyer. I received my cards this week. I ordered the Australian Bird Pack, and that'll be great for sending overseas. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. As a uh, Sounds like Edwin has set quite a task for me to unpack today, um, and I have been doing quite a bit of reading during the week um, as I've explored this, uh, this very apocalyptic passage. Um, as we begin our worship today, let us pray. Love and God gather with us as we take a moment from the busyness of the world, from all of its information and all of its calls to our attention, to just be in your presence and in the presence of others. We thank you that we have a space to gather, a place which is quiet, a place that provides us with the opportunity to reflect on who we are, whose we are, and where we are going. We praise you for that opportunity today, and thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to sing our first hymn today, which is often used to explore and express the words of Mary, and so we'll be hearing those in a couple of weeks. But also in today's lectionary, we get those similar words expressed by Hannah way back in the Old Testament. And so um, we have a reoccurring theme of um, exploring and, and, and putting out these words of, of exaltation of the Magnificat. So let us sing together, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's come before God with our prayers of adoration and confession. Loving God, we give you thanks for our constructions, for the ways in which we can build one thing upon another, for the ways in which we build buildings and great architecture 
for the imagination that you have given us to be able to say how we might be able to make use of resources to build things that are of benefit to humanity, things we can invent, things we can pull together. Loving God, we give you thanks for the ways in which you've given us this creativity and the ability to be able to construct one thing after another. But loving God, we confess to you that there are times where we use this power of imagination and construction and creativity to create things that are not for the betterment of all humanity, that we construct things that are dangerous. We construct weapons, sometimes weapons of mass destruction, that have the capacity to do damage on a large scale. Not only do we construct things physically, but we construct arguments that are deliberately designed to bring down, to isolate, to exclude. We pray that we might be able to explore and know the difference between those things that we are constructing that will be positive and loving, that will bear fruit and fruit that lasts, and the construction of buildings, of processes, of spaces, of arguments and ideas and ideologies that will cause harm and damage and disunity. We confess to you that we have such power to do such wonderful things to build and we confess that we have the power to destroy, to bring down and to hurt. Loving God, help us in all ways to remember that you are a God of love and that you call us to love. May all of our constructions, all of our creativity, all of our wonders bring glory to your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The good news to us is that no matter where we are, how we have been or what we have done, that God is open to giving us new opportunities and new possibilities. And so I say to you this morning, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. picture and you'll see it a bit later during the sermon um, of, of a building that I saw when I was in Berlin in 2019. I saw this ruined church named after the first German Kaiser Wilhelm I and it was planned by his grandson as a construction between 1891 and 1895. The church originally had five towers housing the second largest church bells in all of Germany but these were later melted down from munitions during the Second World War. During the Allied bombing in 1943, the church sustained severe damage, severing the upper portion of the main spire, collapsing the roof. In our reading later this service, we'll hear Mark telling uh, of the words of Jesus, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another, and all will be thrown down. I couldn't help but be reminded of these words as I looked upon this ruined building that was still standing in the middle of Berlin, a testament to the fragility of our great structures and the ways in which we have to be careful 
that we do not worship the things that we have made, but always look towards the God who creates everything. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on. Uh, so keep your eye out for that, that uh, picture of um, the, the, that um, ruined building um, later on in the service. But I'm going to hand over to Andrew now, who's going to share what's going on around the place. And for those online, if uh, you're listening, we, we'll be going silent for a little while to protect um, the, uh, the integrity uh, and privacy of, of, of um, the local congregation. So you can get a cuppa, um, and maybe if you've left something on or need to change something, then you can do that as well. But we'll be back um, with the next hymn after Andrew's finished. Are we good? Yeah. Just got to check with the producer to make sure everything is good. We're going to sing our next hymn now, Rock of Ages Cleft for Me. Um, this song um, is a beautiful song about how we might stand in, in God's security, in God's love. So let's sing together.
I think the hardest thing about having no voice at the moment is not being able to sing um, such wonderful songs. And um, I can really feel it when I come along to church, but I can't actually let my voice rise with that. Um, we're going to hear our reading today, which comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 18. As he, that's Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones, what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting at the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be accomplished? And what will be the sign that these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear, the word, hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. Through this, may we find God's word for us today. As I was uh, reflecting on this passage today, which I've, I've read many times in the past, and knowing that I'm a lover of science fiction and apocalypse, a piece of apocalyptic literature, <laughs> As I read various commentaries pointing to different parts of the Bible in Revelation and Daniel to try and explain and make sense of what Jesus is saying here, I suddenly came upon one particular quote, a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It really caught my attention and I kept coming back to it. The quote goes like this. Stupidity is more dangerous an enemy than of good than malice. One may protest against evil, it may be exposed, and if needed, prevented by use of force. Evil always carries within itself a germ of its own subversion that in it leaves behind human beings at least a sense of unease. Against stupidity, we are defenceless. Neither protests or the use of force accomplish anything here. Reasons fall on deaf ears. Facts that contradict one's prejudgment simply need not be believed. In such moments, stupid people um, even become, uh, in such moments, the stupid person even becomes critical. And when facts are irrefutable, they are just pushed aside as inconsequential, as incidental. In all this, the stupid person, in contrast to the malicious one, is utterly self satisfied, being easily irritated becomes dangerous, dangerous by going on the attack. For that reason, greater caution is called for when dealing with the stupid person than the malicious one. Never again will we try to persuade the stupid person with reasons, for it is senseless and dangerous. This quote, as I said, that comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and pastor, an anti-Nazi dissident in his work Letters and Papers from Prison, Bonhoeffer wrote during his imprisonment by the Nazis, reflecting deeply on the nature of evil and morality and social dynamics under authoritarian regimes. I don't know why it stuck with me, but as I kept reading this, I started to reflect on the ways in which I might be three different kinds of people. I certainly know that I'm capable of being a malicious person. I'm quite capable of losing my temper, saying things that I don't mean, plotting the downfall of others around me. And I confess that regularly and know that it's quite possible. In fact, part of the pathway towards being the second kind of person, the good person, is actually understanding the maliciousness that can exist when I'm at my worst. I guess that's where it brings us to the third kind of person that I know that I am at times. And this is the kind of person that Dietrich Bonhoeffer is actually working through here the stupid person. You see, if I were to actually proclaim to myself that I had no maliciousness within me, that I was not capable of evil, that I was actually entirely good, 
And I actually think that I'm slipping into the position of the stupid person. I'm actually making a statement to say that I'm actually capable um, of, of only good things would be to ignore the possibility that might actually make me truly capable of evil. Bonhoeffer was arrested in 1943 for his involvement in resistance against Adolf Hitler during the plot to assassinate the dictator. From his prison cell, he wrote extensively on theology, ethics, and his observations of human behavior. Bonhoeffer lived under a regime that manipulated the truth, spread propaganda, relied on mass complicity to carry out atrocities. He observed how many ordinary Germans were swept up in the Nazi ideology. They supported evil actions, not out of malice, or but from an inability or unwillingness to think critically. Bonhoeffer distinguished between malice, intentional wrongdoing, and stupidity, a kind of moral or intellectual blindness. While malice can be combated with truth and justice, stupidity is more insidious because it is self-sustaining and immune to reasoning. In this passage, stupidity refers to how an individual or societies can be manipulated into thoughtless complicity through propaganda, social pressures and ideological conformity. Bonhoeffer argues that stupidity poses a greater threat than malice because it renders people impervious to logic, ethics, self-reflection. Stupidity fuels authoritarianism by normalising irrationality and silencing dissent. Now all of this sounds very political and sociological and I'm supposed to be up here as the minister of the word preaching to you about theology. But as I was reading through this passage during the week and Jesus is making this statement to say how will we know? Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and, and say I am he and they will lead us astray. We will hear wars and rumours of wars, but do not be alarmed, for this must take place for the end to come. For a nation will rise against a nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places and famines. But this is the beginning of the birth pains. I have to say to you, I've had quite a couple of weeks. In the last couple of weeks, a close friend of mine died in a senseless accident just going for a walk hit by a bike out on the street. I've seen a volcanic eruption kill hundreds of people in Bali and strand many others. I've heard rumours of wars and earthquakes, earthquakes in Australia. Why only just yesterday there was an earthquake up at Musselbrook and I saw the images of shopping centres and goods shaking and falling from their shelves. It seems that this passage actually speaks very heavily to me at the moment because I'm trying to make sense of all of this information and understand how I might actually choose to be the good person, not the malice person, not the stupid person. I know I'm not alone in this. I'm aware that you are out there also listening to the same news, the same broadcast, the same information, hearing the same stories from friends, receiving the same grief that you might be experiencing from the loss of close friends feeling the separation from family. In the midst of all of this, it can become really overwhelming. And the temptation is to decide to just close our ears and just say, la, 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 la. Maybe we can just close our ears and our eyes and it will all go away. The problem with that is, I believe that what Jesus is telling us when he's saying, keep awake, keep your eyes open, watch out, He's warning us not to close our ears and our eyes to all that's going on around us, but to watch and read the signs and to remember who we are and who we are called to be. It's really easy for us to become the stupid person. We can do so with political narratives, as I've just said, global conflicts, one side framing the events as defence of a national sovereignty and the other saying that they need to resist in the name of human rights. I could be talking about many or any of the conflicts that are taking place. In elections, we claim widespread fraud while others present evidence to show no significant issues at all, creating public confusion and division. If we think about climate change, 
Some information stresses the urgency of human caused climate change in its catastrophic consequences, while others downplay human responsibility and focus on uncertainty. Science seems to tell us one thing absolutely and 100% one week and then refute it the next. It's no wonder we are confused. It's no wonder we are tempted to give up critical thinking altogether and just become stupid people. Even in our own country in Australia, there are perspectives on colonisation ranging from celebrating it as national development and saying that all people begin in an equal position and others acknowledging the deep harm and injustice that has been done to Indigenous people. Locally, amongst ourselves, we are involved in gossip and miscommunication, conflicting accounts of events in families and communities create tension. They said this versus they said that. No, they didn't. People witnessing the same event may recount it completely differently from their unique biases or emotional responses. Are you depressed yet? So where is the good news? How can we actually make sense of this? What does it mean for us to keep awake? What does it mean for us to remain good people, to not be malicious people, but worse, as Bonhoeffer recounts, to prevent ourselves from becoming stupid people. I think that there are a number of things that we can do. In ourselves, we can cultivate spiritual awareness. Daily prayer and meditation, regularly connecting with God through prayer and quiet reflection, however might, this might be best suited for you. This might be listening to music, reading poetry, writing poetry, exploring where God might be and allowing ourselves those silent moments where there's not tons of information pouring in and pounding on our intellect. Mindfulness. Studying the scriptures. Diving into the Bible, not just for knowledge, but for wisdom. Not reading it just for its literal out outpouring, but actually asking critically, what is this story for? Why is it here? Doing this in groups, doing this together, can provide us with the opportunity. I know that when I read scripture all by myself, I am my only conversation par partner. Can this be also a path towards stupidity if the only person I listen to is myself? Getting together with people who might challenge that worldview, hearing different perspectives, asking good questions. And the practice of gratitude is also a part of cultivating spiritual awareness, actively noticing and giving thanks for God's work in the world wherever we can see it. Perhaps we might walk past a flower or hear a bird singing. Perhaps we may hear a story of good news, a story where people have behaved well and loved one another. Practicing gratitude for these things, telling these stories to ourselves and to others, actively noticing and giving thanks for God's work in the world and in our lives. I think I'm gonna sip some water so I can keep going. I think the second thing we can do is live with purpose. When we are lost, my grandfather used to say to me, idle hands are the devil's playground. Idle minds, I think, might just be the same. Focusing on the present, instead of obsessing over the future or the past, living intentionally right now, honouring God in this moment. Looking for the ways we can engage in acts of love and justice and kindness. Jesus often highlighted active love as a sign of readiness to be a part of God's plan. Staying alert, using our talents for the benefit of others and for God's purpose. Asking ourselves, how might God use my giftedness today? Not just drifting along and hoping for the best, but actually saying to yourself, if God is love and God calls us to love, then what are the acts of love that I will be involved in?
today. These are all active things. The third way is to build community, accountability, surrounding ourselves with people who will inspire and encourage us to stay in a path of faithfulness. Who is it that we gather with regularly? And when we gather, what do we talk about? Why do we talk about it? And how are we actually actively engaged in community together? Now, it would be natural for me to also say that worshipping together, regular fellowship with each other, a moment just like this, whether you be here or far away, gathering together to have our minds provoked so that we might ask critical questions and explore the things that really matter to us, discussing scripture and the way it intersects with our life's challenges, a way that we can deepen our understanding and awareness not just reading it once and walking away, but actually taking the opportunity to read it in community together so that we may have a better understanding of who we are and what God is saying to us. I think number four is one of the hardest. Trying to work out what distracts you. Identifying and reducing habits that actually dull spiritual senses, such as excessive consumption of entertainment, materialism and constant busyness. I know that when I don't want to think about something, I make myself extremely busy so that I don't have time to consider, so that I can get past. And that busyness creates an illusion for me that says, well, I am doing lots of stuff, so everything must be okay. But it doesn't last. Resist being pulled into fear or distracted by social pressures. Evaluate the media that you're listening to. Ask yourself, who is saying this? Why are they saying this? And who's paying them to say it? Create space for God by letting letting go of unnecessary distractions that clutter your heart and mind. Make intentional decisions to say, if this offends me, if I'm struggling with this, if this doesn't seem to fit well with the gospel of love and compassion, If this causes harm to others, perhaps I ought not to be listening. Maybe I should change the channel. There are certain things that when we listen to them over and over again, they can change the way that our brain is programmed and dynamic. Ask yourself, how many different sources of media or news or information are you consuming? Is it wide? Is it diverse? Are you giving yourself the opportunity to hear different stories and different perspectives? Keep your eyes open for God's work. Pay attention to how God is working in your life, in the world and through people. Celebrate those moments where things work, where you pray for something and it happens. If you're like me, then perhaps you might pray to God for things and say, dear God, please let this happen. And when it happens, you quickly go, well, that was great that that happened and get on with living in that moment. But I actually think it's really important that we celebrate. In our family, often we have arguments about whether or not it's actually ethical to pray for a car parking space when you're running late late for an appointment. And the jury's still out on whether or not that's a good idea or not a good idea. There's lots of theological implications. If I pray here in Geelong, in my privileged life, wearing my clean jacket with my um, wonderful roads and spaces for a car parking space? Am I denying God's power to a child in Africa who is starving to death? I don't know the answer to that question except to say that my understanding of God's power is that it's infinite. And whilst it might be interesting and entertaining to engage in such debates whilst we're looking for a car parking space, running late for an appointment, The reality is when such a parking space appears, we should celebrate. We should should praise God, especially if we ask God for it. The question of whether we should have asked God for it, that's another whole sermon and I won't go into that today. But it's it's an example of the way in which we are to look for and actively um, celebrate when God answers our prayers. Not all events are signs, however. Not everything that happens is God 
Sometimes there just happens to be a car parking space and you can pull into it. I think staying awake means keeping a faith, even when the future feels uncertain or delayed. The death of my friend has hit me very hard over the last weeks. And a number of people have actually tried to tell me why such a thing might happen or how it might be a part of God's plan. But I actually think I'm satisfied to say, even if there was actually a really good reason presented to me, it wouldn't change the pain that I feel. It wouldn't change the way that it causes a loss and it makes a question about what might have been a future different. It doesn't change the way that my heart hurts for Michelle's husband, James, and her son, uh, Zane. It doesn't hurt, doesn't change the fact that over the last six years that I've been here, that perhaps I could have been a better friend, that I could have made more contact, that I could have been more connected. No reasons will actually make that happen. But keeping the faith in the face of those things that make me feel uncertain, recognising that even though I don't have answers to those things, that I don't need answers to those things in order to actually just dwell in the experience of the loss and to celebrate our life and the opportunity there was to know such a person. Hope is an active practice that keeps us spiritually alive. It has to be ever-changing. It has to connect us. Hope is that thing that we need most when we're in the midst of hopelessness. Like the candles that we can find when there is a blackout that sit around on our benches and on our mantelpieces all the time, completely unnoticed. They become essential when the night is darkest and our hope is the same. Keeping awake means being open to change and transformation. That each new person that we meet gives us the opportunity to see the universe in a new way. And maybe not in a way that we like. Or maybe in a way that does confirm everything that we do like. We need to approach life with a heart ready to learn and adapt and deepen our understanding. So even though the first half of my sermon was full of all of this, how can we possibly work out how to do this, I've just given you a long list of things that we can do in order to make sure that we keep our hearts good, free of malice and free from stupidity. I wrestled strongly with this quote when I first said, and I wondered whether or not I could get up here and read about stupid people in church. It does sound very judgmental. But I hope that today you haven't heard me say in judgment of other people and their stupidity but you've actually watched me reflect on my own stupidity, my own sense of morality and the ways in which I'm good and the ways in which I am malicious. Because it's actually only through this spiritual practice that each and every one of us can live and grow and follow the calling that God has set before us. I hope I have not offended anybody today. However, if you are feeling like I've called you malicious or stupid, then perhaps Bonhoeffer is telling you you've got a bit of work to do and that there might be some things you need to attend to in your own life, as I hope you've been witnessing me attend to in my own. Let us pray. Loving God, give strength to good people. Help their hearts to remain ready to do good works of love and compassion. Help our goodness grow and flourish and bear fruit and fruit that lasts. Love and God, soften the hearts of malicious people, people traumatized by experience and pain, people certain that they are absolutely right when they enact oppression and evil on those around them. We pray that you may guard our hearts against malicious action, that you may in every way help us to be people who seek justice with compassion and mercy, 
and walk humbly with God. And loving God, we pray for stupid people. We pray that in our moments of stupidity, that we may be provoked into thinking deeply, listening to voices, exploring the possibilities, and being open to the way in which love may convict us of our own ignorant beliefs, so that we may have a better understanding and view of the universe and the way you have made it. Loving God, today we pray for the good, the malicious and the stupid. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing a wonderful song which I hope expresses much of what we've been talking about today. Have faith in God, my heart, all the parts of our body, all the parts of who we are and how we might give them to God. So let's sing together. We offer God our goodness, our maliciousness, and our stupidity today. Um, um, Thank you. The God who loves us more than we can imagine. The God who loves us when we are good. The God who loves us when we are bad. To the Lord who loves us when we are stupid. We offer you ourselves today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God from whom all
that's come before God with our prayers for our world. Let us pray. Loving God, from our place here in Australia, in this land now called Australia, we hear wars and rumours of wars. We hear of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. We hear of damage done. Loving God, come like a rushing wind. Come into each and every one of those places and spaces and bring your healing love, compassion, hope. We pray that there may be miracles, miracles of people's hearts being changed from maliciousness to good, to people's ears being ready to hear the stories of those who are very different to them. Loving God, we pray in this time that we may seek you with our whole hearts. We think of those known to us who are unwell or lost or grieving at this time. We pray that you might, your hand might be upon them and that you may guide them beside still waters and green meadows. And that even should we be passing through the valley of the shadow of death, that your rod and staff will comfort us. Loving God, as we live in this confusing world filled with conflicting information, <coughs> we pray that you will help us to work out who we are and where we are from and how we may live. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and we share together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn today is Be Thou My Vision. Let us sing together as we conclude our service.
go from this place? We go from this place, examining our own hearts, knowing that we have the capability of being malicious and evil, being ready to examine and think critically about who we are, so that we may guard ourselves against stupidity and be ready to serve God with all our love. May we walk with God, seeking justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. In the name of Christ. Amen.